thank you for coming. It's good to see you. Um, I don't know what you were expecting from uh, the title, but um, I can tell you uh, today we are going to talk about paper. And I don't mean digital paper, I mean, you know, uh, like this kind of paper. And um, one of our most um, beloved clients, um, as you may know, is Lufthansa. And um, yeah, we do a lot in, in aviation. And I was wondering, does any one of you know what um, a flight bag is? Do you, know, do you know what a flight bag is? Anyone? Just guess. What do you think? So basically, a flight bag is just a bag full of paper. And um, it uh, used to be taken into the uh, flight deck by uh, the pilots. And it has a lot of paper in it, manuals, um, uh, charts, uh, all sorts of uh, things you need on the flight. Uh, and to be precise, it actually weighs around 20 uh, kilos, 20 kilos of paper that pilots uh, are taking into the cockpit. Now, um, Lufthansa is a very uh, digital adept um, airline. So Lufthansa has replaced the flight bag quite a while ago with the so-called EFB, the electronic uh, flight bag. So um, the tablet PC was really kind of revol revolutionary for the aviation industry, and it basically killed the paper uh, flight bag. And uh, I read from one particular airline that they actually save seven, uh, 16 million sheets of paper per year by introducing the EFB. And I personally, I believe that augmented and virtual reality, or mixed reality, has the potential to be as big as a game changer um, as the tablet, the first tablet PC was. That's what I personally um, believe. And I want to give you one uh, example um, that we did with uh, Lufthansa, a video, and I will tell you a little bit about it. So what we did is uh, we developed um, a training for pilots uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. And what it does is it helps the pilot students to complete their training or to prepare for their training for VFR. Uh, it has nothing to do with VR. VFR stands for Visual Flight Rules. And what they learn here is they fly by waypoints. So instead of instruments, they have to recognize things in the landscape. For example, um, a lake. And I was on one of these flights, and I can tell you, as you can see from the landscape, a lake in the Arizona desert is just a dirt pit dried out with a different shade of brown. So it's really very difficult to identify. So this kind of training is very difficult and very demanding for the pilot students. And I recently met one of the pilots who helped us develop this um, training. Um, I made, met him coincidentally on a flight from Berlin to Frankfurt. And I went to the flight deck and said hello. And um, I took a little uh, selfie. I'm usually not a selfie guy, but as you can see, I, uh, I was really proud uh, that day. Not only because he had his last day of flight lessons, so he, he just um, graduated, basically, and became a commercial pilot then. But I was also proud because he told me um, he also happens to be a psychologist. Um, he studied psychology. And he told me that in their research, they found out that um, by using this VR app that we made, they increased the overall performance of the pilots by 15%. Um, so scientifically proven, it's 15% 15% better than training with just paper. Because at the moment, the preparation for this kind of um, flights is also very much paper-based. Um, so as you can see, I'm really picking a fight with paper uh, today. So uh, let's stick with paper. I have another example for you. 
Um, and this is really hard for me because I actually I love this kind of um, paper manual uh, because I used it as a kid a lot. Um, but in this case, we worked with Lego in Denmark. And um, this was our first augmented reality um, training, basically, you can call it training. And what we did was we were also aiming at replacing the paper. And um, you may remember there used to be a device called uh, Google Glass. And by the way, it's still around. Google Glass is still around, um, but it's mostly used in the industry now, uh, which doesn't really surprise me. And um, yeah, we made an uh, augmented reality uh, instruction manual. Now, um, I probably, in my head at least, I can hear some mumbling of people saying, but Google Glass, that's not augmented reality. Come on. I mean, that's just a screen that you see. Well, it is not augmented reality unless you make Metaio run on Google Glass. That's what we did back then. I don't know if you know Metaio still. They were bought by Apple, and it's basically now AR kit. It's a, it was a Munich-based company, German, German company, a really big success story. Um, so running Metaio on Google Glass basically means that um, from battery 100 to zero in 20 minutes. Um, but I can tell you it was really uh, worth it if you see these smiling faces of the kids. They really had fun. We tested it in um, two Lego stores in Copenhagen and in Frankfurt, and they really, they really had a blast. Um, bless you. Um, since then, we implemented quite a few very similar projects with different clients. One of these clients is um, Bilfinger. They are an industrial services company, so they maintain um, big machines for other uh, companies. And they also rolled out a step-by-step -step instruction app. And um, I'm, uh, I'm absolutely convinced now after seeing all this, and we are officially declaring this right now, that um, we think that augmented and virtual reality means the death of paper manuals. That's what I believe, the death of paper manuals. And um, it, will be, uh, it will be painful, and it might take a while, a little while, and some people might not uh, want to admit it, um, but I really believe so. And today I have someone here, I think, who shares this uh, vision with me. He's part of um, a team, he's the head of the team at Deutsche Bahn, along with Zama, Johannes, and uh, Tobias. Please welcome Stefan Roth. Hi. Thank Stefan. you very much. Hello. Hi. Stefan, um, I, th I really think um, it's an amazing collaboration that we have because um, it's, it's a kind of a special uh, relationship with a client because you have your own uh, developer team. Exactly. And yeah, um, yeah we are really pr uh, proud to be like a wheel in this amazing um, machinery. It's a very special kind of uh, working for a client. Um, would you mind uh, showing us what you did at Deutsche Bahn? Maybe a little demo. Yeah, it would be a pleasure. I mean, I'm, at least I try to. Let's, let's see how it works out. Um, so what we actually did uh, was, uh, this is just an example that you see right now. We did an interactive repair guidance for, in this case, coffee machines of the high-speed trains in Germany, the ICE trains. Um, going to look up and see the application. Yeah, there it is. And then just switch over here. Yeah, I think I can see you guys. Is this co correct? No? Not yet. Maybe like that. It's better. So you may, my, might expect a little bit or see a little bit of lag, but let's try how far we get. So what you can see here is actually uh, a digital twin of the coffee machine. Very funny thing, you can see it outside also, they have the same type. And you can repair it uh, without any knowledge of the machine before. Um, this is, um, so this twin is laid uh, exactly on top of the machine, so uh, usually you wouldn't uh, see the machine since I didn't bring the machine here on stage. Um, you, normally you would just see uh, uh, things like this here, so the coffee grounds container Please coming out, uh, container. but uh, the, the machine is about um, 85 kilos and weighs a little bit lot, so um, let's uh, take this within, with, with, with the digital twin together. Um, you can see um, several parts here. Um, I can 
have a look into the machine Please and uh, sure see the directly where are the uh, switches to unbranch this machine. Um, the so the whole application is um, by our technicians use voice commands. Let's try it out. Check step. Yeah, OK, it's a little check step. No, it's, um, so this is why we have also this uh, gesture thing here. It's a little bit too noisy here right now. And it shows me step by step what to do on the real Please machine as, as sort of holograms. Uh, move a little bit forward. Um, it's really, really intuitive. For example, uh, see this kind of animation here. I have to disconnect um, some sort of holes here. And um, it's uh, not, not that, that easy to find out. So I, I see an animation how this works and where, where this water supply is, if I didn't, didn't know it before. And so I can disassemble and reassemble the whole machine step by step. Let's move a little bit forward um, to see some cooler features. Um, maybe a little bit hectic for you. Please, Hope please you don't get seasick. Um, I think you get a good picture of it, what it, what it actually does, right? Yeah. For example, there's a part. Please lose the screw of the protective there's a, there's a, uh, some plate which you have to take out from the real machine. Um, the if you describe this in text form, you can imagine. Here. Now take the plate, move it around 25 degrees uh, counterclockwise on the up, down, down left corner, I think. It's very totally complicated confused. to explain um, on paper, right? Yeah, and the cool thing, uh, what, what we experience with our technicians, who are th th even those guys who never did it before, um, they do this step correctly from the beginning uh, because it's so intuitive. So you don't have to learn complicated things. You just get immersed directly and see what's going on there. We visualize stuff like that. For example, there for a coffee machine is even cool, cool stuff. Um, there's a hot cylinder here that you can see. Uh, we, so we visualize this so that you don't burn your hands, actually. This is about um, visualizing uh, features you cannot see, like pr pressure, temperature, voltage, whatever. Um, and this guides us through the whole application. And uh, after a while, this module is uh, then exchanged, which is actually uh, the goal of this whole repair. Now, we now, really want to give you a deep um, insight on please this project. So, um, Stefan, I have prepared some questions here that I would like to ask yeah. you. You're welcome. Um, um, so, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the, the project. Mm -hmm. um, so, every time we, we talk about this uh, in front of an audience, I kind of see people smiling when they get a first glance at what we actually did that we picked the coffee um, machine. Um, yeah, we are uh, coffee experts, I have so to say. <laughs> was, this, uh, was the coffee machine actually, was it the first uh, thing that you chose, or were there other use cases that you considered? No, uh, actually, we started with other use cases, really. Um, uh, we had something for uh, measuring the axis of the IC trains. Um, but it, um, when we really went to the workshop at 11 o'clock in the, in, the, in, the, in the night shift, and we saw people grinding things out there, and so you have a lot of sparks flying around. You do this once with this device, afterward, afterwards it's, it's burned totally to char. So, um, yeah. But then um, it was the co colleagues from the long distance trains who really came to us. The coffee machine is really a case which mm. is annoying for us because you might all know it also from, from your own mm. experience maybe with Deutsche Bahn. Uh, you get a morning uh, into, the, in, into the train and uh, uh, no coffee is working. So why I, th is it I think case? that's why people are smiling because they can feel the pain that's in that moment because you've mm. all experienced it. And uh, yeah, I mean Deutsche Bahn is working on, on solving this. So uh, you told me that in retrospect the coffee machine was actually a lucky pick because it stands for um, a couple of other repairs, a certain type of repair. Can you tell us what type of repair that is? Yeah, think about uh, toilets or climate controls or doors or whatever could, could be stuck there. Everything which is not uh, absolutely safety necessary, um, which is usually um, you have to wait uh, for things to be repaired to, um, uh, till, the, till the train comes back into the workshop. Mm -hmm. So this may take you a week. This is why we experience with the coffee machine. So it takes you a week to get the things repaired. And um, it's because right now it's the only way to repair such things. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea behind it is to get out uh, working forces in the night shift on the, on the, um, where the trains are standing, on the parking places actually, 
and do repairs like that autonomously with a digital assistant. So it's, it's also quite revolutionary in, uh, revolutionary in that regard because it means that these types of um, repairs don't have to be done in the workshop anymore. At the moment, they have to be done in the workshop. No. So um, in, uh, in Germany, we have um, a skilled uh, labor shortage. And um, of course, the service technicians who do these repairs, they can't be everywhere. So at the moment, these limited service technicians, they are in, in the workshop. But what, what really does HoloLens change in this scenario? So HoloLens changes the way you look at the sort of repair. Um, I mean, every technician, of course, at Deutsche Bahn is, is trained to do these sorts of repair. Nobody will be repairing even a coffee machine without being licensed to do it. But imagine um, a stressful situation, or you get, you get pushed somewhere. And, or remember, um, imagine um, repairs where you don't know. You have done it half a year before. And you learned everything by heart, but uh, in the moment you, you want to acquire this, you want to use this, you're totally blocked. And this is a helper which, which helps you to get more safety doing the job. Like right on the job while you're doing it. Yeah, yeah. On the, so we are getting away from this paradigm learning everything by heart and then hopefully know it later on. Uh, this might be necessary for pilots. I, I, I mean, they should know how, yeah. to, how to fly things, uh, would be good. Um, but for a coffee machine, actually, I don't want anyone to know how this is assembled and disassembled. This can be done by a digital assistant. Because there are so many different kinds, and you have to learn them all, and, yes. and, and then you don't need them for quite a while. Right? And it so, wants the diversity of, of the personnel. So that's basically the difference between VR and AR. VR is more for repairing, for learning how to do things yeah. in advance that you mm -hmm. urgently need in a safety scenario, and mm -hmm. other repairs can be done right on the job with augmented reality. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we've talk, talked a lot about replacing um, paper manuals today. Uh, what do you think HoloLens really does better than paper? Um, Hol HoloLens is uh, so much more immersive, and um, this, is, um, this is really comes to play. Uh, so we ask, uh, it's, it's not so interesting what we find cool as, a, as, as, as a technicians doing stuff, but we ask really the people in the workshop down there repairing, getting hands dirty, um, whenever they experienced it, for example, we asked them, wouldn't it be Google Lens, or also Google uh, Glass, would it be sufficient? And they said, no, not at all. They need this immersive kind because it's so natural. It feels so natural. If you see the things coming out, like the plate we saw before, um, you don't have to learn something uh, like a complicated application, but it just feels natural. So it brings back the user interface into the real world. Absolutely. What we are used yeah. to, evolutionary-wise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you very much, Stefan, for the, for the interview. Pleasure.